On this episode of Indiana Expeditions, we'll uncover one of Indiana's greatest resources, limestone, a world-famous building material that comes from right beneath our feet. We'll dig for fossils and search for buried treasures. Follow me, it's time for another expedition. Indiana Expeditions with Rick Crosland is made possible through the generous support of the Eli Lilly and Company Foundation, dedicated to improving the lives of patients and the communities we serve. The Dr. Laura Hare Charitable Trust, enhancing Indiana's natural environment through preservation and protection of ecologically significant natural areas, and promoting environmental education, stewardship, and awareness and the Indiana Academy of Science, serving Indiana science since 1885. On this episode of Indiana Expeditions, I'm going to explore underground Indiana. Now I could use a shovel like this, but I'll tell you, that's gonna take me a while. Luckily, I know a shortcut. Check this out. This is the Independent Limestone Quarry, and I'm standing here on the hill overlooking all of the operation. This is where they quarry or dig out the limestone that is used in building materials all over the world. We're standing on Indiana Limestone. Indiana Limestone, that's correct. The depth today is the overburden of 60-some feet, and then we go into 40-some odd 50 feet of good cell material. This is a quarry, right? And so well, the, the word quarry, what does that mean? A quarry is, is, a, is a mine, uh, uh, and ours is a surface mine. This saw behind me is like a giant chainsaw that cuts over 12 feet deep through solid limestone. Once these large limestone slabs are cut, they have to be moved over so they can be shipped down. That takes some real power. Check this out. What you just saw only took a few minutes with modern technology. Can you imagine 100 years ago using raw hammer power and mules to do the same thing? But today, thanks to new technology, chisels, pneumatic bags, 140 tons was just brought over in one single move. Now what they're going to do is break this large slab up into more manageable pieces. And they're going to do that by drilling some holes and then using the power of hydraulics to split it open. And that's going to be cool to see. it open up a little bit. The same deposit of limestone goes from Canada all the way down the Gulf of Mexico. Except for here in Indiana in the stone belt, it's pretty close to the surface, which makes going underground in Indiana a lot easier to do. A lot of the limestone that's quarried is not the best quality for building material. Maybe the color's wrong, or maybe it's got some striations in it, but it's still good material that can be used to stop erosion, like these blocks headed to Lake Michigan. I bet you if you look in your own driveway, you'll find some limestone. Next stop, the mill.
pretty cool. There must be a hundred ways to cut limestone. Like this diamond tip saw that slices right through the limestone, almost like it was butter. Every major city east of the uh, Mississippi, going all the way to the east coast, has got Indiana limestone on it. Courthouses, federal courthouses, churches, uh, many, many universities and colleges use it, you name it. We've done the restoration of the uh, west front of the U.S. Capitol building. We did the last 10 years of the two front towers on the Washington Cathedral. We did the Pentagon after 9-11, after the plane went in. Uh, and we've done numerous other buildings in Washington, D.C. We've done some in New York, pretty much all over the East Coast we work. It has taken millions of years for this limestone to form underground in Indiana but it's only taken a couple of days for the Bybee stone cutters and carvers to turn that limestone into some awesome building material that's used around the world. Bybee stone is known for its detailed carving. Carving becomes a lot more three-dimensional and sometimes it becomes more inventive. Mm -hmm. You think you could show me how to do a little piece of that or is that... Uh... Sure. item made or used by humans? Archaeology is the study of people who lived in the past. Archaeologists study the things they left behind. Did you know you can do archaeology too? At certain times of the year, archaeologists all over the state could use your help. One place where you can do archaeology is at Strawtown, Kotewi Park, near Noblesville. We are digging through the dirt with gloves on and going through the dirt, finding pottery, bones, and any items from the prehistoric group of settlers that uh, were in this particular area. Archaeology is the study of the life ways of people who lived in the past by looking closely at the things they left behind. These things are called artifacts. An artifact is anything made, changed, or used by people. The places people lived hundreds or even thousands of years ago have been covered by a lot of dirt. That's why most artifacts that archaeologists study have to be excavated or dug out of the ground using brushes and shovels, trowels, buckets, and screens. Well, the site we're standing on here is called the Straw Tad Enclosure. It is an enclosure site that once had a ditch running around the uh, outside of it with an interior berm. And it's about a, just less than a football field across. And it has uh, three different cultures here uh, on this site. Now these groups were farmers, so they were not nomadic. They would stay here and grow corn in these big bottoms around here at Strawtown. And people who are more stable uh, will have pottery. They made pots. And there's a certain way to make that pot. You, you learn it from your, from your uh, relatives. And you decorate a certain way, and you, it looks a certain way, and you put various inclusions in the clay when you make them. We can look at that design and technique on pot, broken pottery vessels, and that associates the cultures uh, which, who made them. This is a piece of pottery that we found digging through the dirt and going through and trying to find prehistoric items left from storing water, storing things or uh, boiling corn for their tribe. One of the ways archaeologists learn about the lives of people that lived in Indiana hundreds or even thousands of years ago is by making the artifacts they find at the site. This is called experimental archaeology. At most prehistoric sites, there are stone tools called lithics and pieces of charcoal from cooking fires. Ever wonder how they made stone tools or fires without matches or lighters? 
Lithics are stone tools that people have made, and there are different ways that people have made stone tools, but the way that cutting edges, such as knives and arrow points, and uh, some other types of cutting edges are made is by a process called flint napping. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to reduce this a little bit. The idea is that I'm going to have this piece, that is, this large piece that would have been struck from a large nodule, and I'm going to reduce it down to something that's thin. So notice that this one is about similar size, but thin and under control and very even. This one is just has all different, all kinds of shapes and ridges on it. From there, I'll make it very thin and then put notches in it. Instead of striking, I push on the edge until a flake pops off. These triangular blades are just what we're finding here. This is called seating the spindle. So the first thing I'm doing is just burning a little spot so that the two are mated up well and not wobbly. Let me do that. Should smoke quickly. See how quick that smoke comes out of there? Okay, now. All of the friction is down here, and all the friction is down where the two woods are meeting, and what I need is a pile of charred dust that turns into a coal that I can then dump into this wad of bark fiber and blow into flames. So in order to allow that dust to fall into one spot and to allow a little oxygen to be worked around in there, I am going to cut a notch. So hopefully that's enough. It doesn't usually take long. I think the record, my record, is about nine seconds. Okay, let's see now. That is burning. And quickly, before the wind blows it away, I'm gonna pour it into here. And notice how I did that, I did it a very specific way. Let the wind help me out on this one. So there it is, and that is just like a big match. Well, every site's unique. Every site is interesting in, in its own right. But uh, what's very interesting in Straw Town is you know, the preservations went really well. This ranks right up there with any kind of archeological resource in the Midwest, and it's nationally significant. There are three sites on the National Register of Historic Places already listed, and so you have National Register quality sites on this property not only because of the preservation and uh, their condition, but also for what they, the information that they hold and can offer. Are there any small ones? Because I have small hands. If you're interested in becoming an archaeologist or just want to have some hands-on experience in archaeology, Strawtown Katewi Park is the place to start. For more information, check out our website. Can you dig it? Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, is named the father of American archaeology. Underground Indiana is a great place to find fossils, but many of those fossils are buried deep. Now here at my camp, I had a chance to bring some of those deep rocks from underground up to the surface so we could get a better look at what is a fossil here in Indiana. If you can't go underground, find something that used to be. This is a pretty unique place because where I'm walking very recently was underground. But because of erosion and some new construction, I can search for treasures right here without digging. I'm here today to see some pretty interesting plant fossils that are world famous and they're right here under your feet in Indiana. I put together quite a dig team today to look for these underground treasures. Experts from the Children's Museum of Indianapolis, the Indiana Geological Survey, and my friend who brought us out here today, Bruce Stevens from the Department of Natural Resources. Now, Bruce, we got a lot of people here. And one thing about collecting fossils, you don't uh, 
take everybody to your favorite yeah, spot. Yeah, you don't divulge everything, that's for sure. And do you have a little place that maybe you and I can go? Yeah, yeah I got one over the hill here that uh, we might be able to lose the rest All of. All right, let's see if we can get it before they do. Come <laughs> There's three of them just right there right together. There. <laughs> and look at that guy. There's okay. one with lots of potential. The reason so many rocks are here at the surface, all fresh and so, is because companies come to mine coal. This is a shale that surrounds the coal, and you can see this rock is very different. It's a little harder, it's got a shape to it, and it's reddish color. This is a material called siderite, or iron carbonate. And you get all these nodules, you will see some excellent fossils inside them. This is a <laughs> fossil fern from the Pennsylvanian, and this guy lived uh, probably 250 million years or so ago in an old coal swamp. You know, the thing about fossil hunting is it's not a guarantee find. So you have to cover a lot of ground, but every once in a while you find a little spot that's filled with them, like right here. Okay, I got one here, Bruce, and here's one. It's a pretty good one. There's a good one. Sometimes Mother Nature makes it easy and has already done the cracking for you. There's a nice little pile here, Bruce, and actually when you see something like this one that's been washed in the rain, I found the other half of it right laying next to it. Yeah, actually, if you find half, you always want to look around very carefully for the other part. That's a lepidodendron stem. Is, a stem? Is what that is, yes. If you, if you train your eyes, there's a lot to see and a lot of treasures here on the ground. Right, there's a little fern right there. That's a, that's a copterus. Another example of weathering, in this case, weathering that allows us to find a treasure with the work already done. I'm kind of like a kid. I want to crack them now and see what's in them. <laughs> huh? We got DNR versus geology versus children museum. Which one's this one from? Children museum. All right, here we go. Children museum. <gasps> hey, hey one out of one, 100 percent. DNR. Dud. Oh. <laughs> Good luck. All right, this is uh, Indiana Geological Survey. So far, not too much. Now that's what I'm talking about, an underground treasure. I'll tell you, we'll save the rest of the Kraken for back at the lab. Hey guys, I brought my fossils. Hey, welcome hey, Rick. Uh, you wanna come on in and work on those? Sure. Come on in, meet you at the door. You just wanna throw your bucket up on the table? I also brought some fossils I've already cracked. Okay, great. We'll take a look at these in the back. Hey, William, I forgot one important piece about cracking fossils, eye protection. Can you help me out? There you go. Excellent. <coughs> now I'm ready to crack fossils. Oh, very nice. This one is definitely one to show the museum. This is a lot like fishing. You're not guaranteed to catch a fish, but it's a lot of fun. And that's how it is with cracking fossils. Who knows, the next one might be the big one. Here we go. Oh, now that's a cool fern leaf fossil. Ah, this may be a good one. Very cool. Hey, uh, William, come here, check this out. What do you think? Oh, cool. I like that one. Well, this is my last one, and uh, I've got some, uh, I need some help with. All right, let's grab them and take them in the back and show them to Dallas. All right. All right. Hey, Dallas, uh, I got some things for you to take a look at. Just go ahead and set them down here. Well, we had fun collecting these fossils, but now it's time to understand what they are. What do we have here? Well, you've got a great collection, good diversity. Um, I see some stems, um, just fern stems, but you also have some really gorgeous fern fossils, too. That's got beautiful definition, um, really well highlighted. It's a great piece. It's called a, a Lethopterus. We have one right over here. Cool. 
And you also have ferns called precopters, and we have quite a few of those too. Precopters, huh? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a mouthful. Can I ask you, uh, what happened to the leaves and stems that used to be in these fossils? Well, these are carbonized impressions. So basically the decay of these plants caused these nodules to form. And not the actual plant remains itself, mm -hmm. but just, just the impression, like a footprint in the snow. So you end up getting like a, an imprint and a mold and a cast, or that's pretty that's cool. That's pretty much how it works. I notice some other cool fossils. Are these from Indiana? Those are from Indiana too. I'd like to know a little bit more about these. Well, we've got the person who can tell you all about them. Hey, thanks for your time, Dallas. Sure. Hey, Victor, hey, how you doing? Hey, Rick, doing well. So I understand that these are from Indiana also. Yes, these are uh, some of our Indiana famous crinoids. Uh, these are some very old pieces, exceptional pieces. Crinoids lived in the deep seas. This is an actual image, a uh, photograph of a living crinoid here. Most every museum in the world, uh, natural history museums, have these. These have been dispersed from Indiana sites all over the world. So they're very, very uh, important pieces for, for science. So you, I guess we could say that uh, this is one part of underground Indiana that's gone around the world. It definitely has, yes. Wanting to find out more about crinoids, I headed to Crawfordsville to pay a visit to the crinoid king, Tom Witherspoon. So how long have you been doing this? Ever since I was about five years old. So let's say 46 years. Really? We're here in uh, Montgomery County. Is that kind of famous for crinoids? Yes, it is. It's one of the best spots in the world. There's other really good spots, but this is this is really something. This this area here has got has really got it. Mining for fossils here in Montgomery County began in the mid 1860s, about the time of the Civil War. Many of the best crinoids on displays in museums all around the world came from Corey's Bluff, right in Tom's backyard. Okay, look at this. Look at the crinoid right there. See it? See where the stem comes out here? You can see where it goes across here. And then there's the crinoid right there. And there's an impression here of another one. Yeah, this is good. The fossils we are finding today were deposited approximately 350 million years ago and may have formed over 2,000 miles away. Plate tectonics pushed it around and the melting glaciers have eroded it to expose the rock formations you see here. Here's a real nice little crinoid right here. Beautiful. Hey, this location was originally discovered by two young boys back in the 1860s. And they found a fossil down on the gravel bar at the mouth of this ravine here. And it looked like a petrified toad. And it was one of those. It's a crinoid without any arms and the, just a loose calyx. If, I, if someone just found this rock, is that where all the work is, finding it and digging it out? No, that's where the fun is. <laughs> that's where the fun is. Right. The, the value is the skill level of uh, the prep work. Using special tools, Tom and his co-worker Dan clean away the surrounding rock and sediments to reveal the fossils, then reassemble the loose parts like a jigsaw puzzle to end up with the spectacular specimens that you see on display. There's probably 15 to 20 crinoids on there. By the time I'm finished, it's gonna be one beautiful piece. Here's one of my favorite ones in these. Oh in, man, in, that, look is at that. Just, that has just been finished. This is a good, a high quality yes. crinoid. This is a real nice one. See how we trimmed it and scored the back and snapped it mm -hmm. to keep it, give it that natural look. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of, we kind of preserve history that's healthy. This is the best hobby I, that I've ever heard of. Did you know a fossil is preserved evidence of ancient life? When exploring underground Indiana, kids closest to the ground have an advantage. At Hazeldale Elementary, Kindergartners are getting an early start in earth science. Science is for everyone. Science is really an integral part of all our curriculum. In fact, it's like the gateway to curriculum for us. 
Who can tell me what a butterfly scientist is called? Butterfly Zach? Lepidopterist. A lepidopterist. Isn't that a huge word? It's just a natural thing for children to do. They started to use terms like lepidopterist, metamorphosis, chrysalis, and it was not because we were sitting down with a piece of paper and studying, it's because they had those hands-on experiences. Science to me, growing up, was a science book. Um, reading about it, very few um, experiments. I was always interested, and I knew that if I had the opportunity to teach children, it would be different than that. You know what, Play-Doh would be a neat thing to push shells in to make impressions. Yeah. yeah! We could do that. Well, this lesson that about fossils started with actually being a paleontologist. I gave them a paleontologist kit. It had a magnifying glass and a fossil from Indiana. And the children had the opportunity to examine it, to look for characteristics, and then I recorded that information. My experience with the Children's Museum um, going out to the dig site in South Dakota has been wonderful. It's really changed my whole approach to teaching about fossils. Here is an issue. <laughs> I have learned so much from being able to get my hands in the dirt and examine fossils myself with that expert over my shoulder explaining. That's exactly what we try to do here. Um, we get a lot of things done in a half day. Uh, what is that? We make every minute count from the minute they walk in the door to the minute they leave. That learning may not look like learning to adults, but trust me, there's some great things going on, um, even though it's not sitting at a table with papers and pencils. <laughs> Well, I tell you, we started off on fossils and we're ending up making a house. Either way, working with kids is a lot of fun because they have great imaginations and they're filled with natural questions about the world around us. So how's this house going to go? Um, yeah. In this episode, we've been having a lot of fun exploring underground Indiana, finding some awesome treasures. But the real treasures in Indiana are not found underground. The real treasures are students just like this. I'm Rick Croslin. Join me on the next Indiana Expeditions. Hey, is there any gold left in there? Uh -uh. For more information, extra content, and lesson plans, visit indianaexpeditions.org. Indiana Expeditions with Rick Crosland is made possible through the generous support of the Eli Lilly and Company Foundation, dedicated to improving the lives of patients and the communities we serve. The Dr. Laura Hare Charitable Trust, enhancing Indiana's natural environment through preservation and protection of ecologically significant natural areas and promoting environmental education, stewardship, and awareness. And the Indiana Academy of Science, serving Indiana science since 1885. On this episode of Indiana Expeditions, we'll 